The victim was most probably dead before being laid down. Once the heart stopped, gravity drained the body slowly, not in a heavy spurt that would have stained half the street. Thank you, Holmes. I understand why you told me not to change clothes. Do you realize that our behavior didn't alarm anyone? The victim's ordeal was even more discreet. By acting in silence, we have confirmed something. The crime definitely took place here. The victim and her murderer were able to come here without making any noise, and afterwards the murder took place without the slightest cry being uttered. Come, Watson, let's go home. We have spent far too long in this sinister alley. And so, my dear Watson, the day and night which we passed in Whitechapel were enlightening, weren't they? An adventure that I most certainly will never relate, to be in the skin of that poor woman. I prefer not to speak of it further. But have we really learned anything about the murderer? Obviously a man, given the necessary strength. We have little to go on, at least no more than the police. But in my opinion, Inspector Abeline has a trick or two up his sleeve. No, I want to talk about the facts and what we can draw from them. We know where the crime was committed and under what conditions. I would like to ask you about the possible motives for the crime. According to you, Watson, what could have pushed the murderer to act in such a way? Revenge, Holmes? Revenge could be a possible motive, but with one small reservation. We have reason to believe that the victim considered her murderer to be a typical client. A personal drama. Love can certainly lead to many a drama, but we have to consider the fact that the victim didn't know her attacker. Hmm. Theft, perhaps. I have a hard time believing that someone would attack poor Polly so fiercely just to rob her of a few coins. Homicidal insanity, Holmes. It is indubitable that the man who did this to Polly Nichols is not of his full senses. Black magic? I'm not terribly interested in the occult or black magic. Let's give the benefit of the doubt to this motive. Elementary. Very well, Watson. I think that we've exhausted the topic. Take a rest and we'll speak again later. Ah! It would seem that the investigation is advancing, Holmes. Yesterday's star said that a suspect is in the hands of the police, a man with a rather sinister reputation. I was about to join you in your optimistic outlook until you informed me that the good news came from the press, Watson. But surely they wouldn't invent the fact that the police are holding a suspect or the acts that are attributed to him. You will have an exact answer to these two questions in less than 50 seconds, Watson. Pardon? Enter, Inspector. Good day. Dear Watson, allow me to introduce Inspector Abeline. Inspector, Dr. Watson. Inspector? To what do we owe the honour of your presence, Inspector? I heard that the two of you made your way to Whitechapel a few days ago. Your arrival, you are aware, coincides with a very serious affair which our police service is going to great lengths to solve and which is creating strong tensions in the area. Pardon me, but haven't you arrested someone? A certain leather apron? Absolutely not. The man who hides behind this name is indeed being actively searched for by the force. Besides, nothing at the moment suggests that he is the Bucks Row murderer. There, you've been enlightened, Watson. Now it is our turn to answer Inspector Abeline's questions. Indeed. I will be brief and precise. Do you intend to investigate this case, or have you already started? It is to be of service to a friend that I went to Whitechapel. We did, out of curiosity, familiarize ourselves with the preliminary reports, and we made our way to the scene of the crime. Our conclusions are slim, as are the clues. Having not been officially appointed by a client, I believe that my intervention in this business will end there. Very well. To be frank, you take the weight off my shoulders by distancing yourself from the case. Our image isn't very good, to say nothing of what the press puts us through. Thus, if overnight they found out that you were on the case, people would turn against us. 
and they would pester me, overwhelm me, and finally make me out to be responsible for the inevitable failure such a scenario entails. Neither you nor I wish for this to happen. I know that your time is precious, Inspector. I will send you a note regarding my conclusions shortly. With pleasure. Gentlemen? Do you think that he will find the murderer? The chances are slim to non-existent. It is seven days now, short of a confession from the murderer himself. And you will not go further? You heard the Inspector Watson. My presence in Whitechapel would hinder, which doesn't mean that we will drop the case. How is that? The Inspector spoke of me, but not of us. It is you, Watson, who will lead the investigation tonight. It is you who will bring to the police station the little note that I will write regarding our conclusions. Despite the late hour, there is nothing to stop you from making inquiries about this famous leather apron while you are there. Well, if I follow Holmes' instructions, then to begin my investigation into this leather apron, I must first head to the police station. Good evening, sir. What do you... I know you. You were here last week with Sherlock Holmes. Indeed. I have come to bring a message from Sherlock Holmes for Inspector Aberline. Very well, I will pass it on. But come to think of it, someone was asking about you recently. Finley, the caretaker of some shady boarding house nearby. Does that mean anything to you? Ah, perhaps. Actually, I read in the Star that you have arrested a suspect called Leather Apron. You shouldn't believe what you read in that rag, sir. The man is being hunted, but we have yet to get our hands on him. And we aren't close to it either. Why ever not? Bah, he's a specialist in the streetwalker racket. These girls make pitiful witnesses, and we don't inspire confidence. Furthermore, the man seems to be pretty discreet lately. Someone must be helping to hide him. How to get on his trail, then? One of these girls would have to confide in us and give a valid description of the man. Then we'd ask around the journeymen, who use aprons, I imagine. Well, goodbye. I must go to Finley's boarding house. I must go to Finley's boarding house. Good evening, Finley. Oh, good evening, sir. Aren't you the gentleman who was with the great detective the other time? That is indeed me, Dr. Watson. Tell me, Finley, I was told that you were looking for us at the police station. Indeed, I wanted to thank you for last time, you know. That vagrant has never set foot round mine again. I even found a tenant, one who pays his rent, I mean. You don't seem very happy, but you were lucky to have found a good tenant so quickly. It's just that this man is very strange. He paid several days in advance and I gave him a key to the place. Since then he goes out every night and returns at ungodly hours. I'm sure he goes to visit the ladies, but still, every night. And when he moved in, something must have broken in his case and stank up the stairs in his room for two days. I think it was a jar. It must be over there. Tell me, have you heard talk of Leather Apron? By the papers, that's all. This man seems very sinister. Do you know any journeymen who use this type of apron? The slaughterhouse butchers, I believe, but definitely the cobblers. I know one, old Isaac Solomonovich. His workshop is on a small street in the Jewish community, across from the hospital. He's a good man. He can help you. But you know, the people there are very close and don't share much with non-Jews.